Welcome everyone to another episode of Conversations with Anne Marie. I am Anne Marie, the Art of Healing. Boy, do I have a treat for us today. Uh, this young woman that I have with me, I met her a few weeks ago at the Journey to Truth conference in Grafton, Illinois. Her name is Katie Weiss. She is a channeler and uh, we just had this lovely connection and I really wanna get to know her and uh, the beings that she channels. So without further ado, I will introduce Katie. Welcome Katie to Conversations with Anne Marie. Thanks so much, I'm glad to be here. You're very welcome. I am so excited to get to know you. Um, just uh, to let everybody know, uh, we were both at the Journey to Truth conference uh, last month in Grafton, Illinois, and uh, my friend Tyler is like, you've got to hear this woman. She's going to be channeling, and I'm like, channeling? I channel. So I was like, let's go. Let me go listen. And uh, you channeled uh, two nights, and you brought through two different beings. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your channeling journey? How is it that you became a channeler? Sure. Um, so it started with, as often happens in awakening, um, a challenge. In my case, it was I got very sick. Oh, okay. Um, so starting about nine years ago, I started to develop all sorts of mysterious symptoms that continued to evolve and get worse. And as I'm sure some people can relate to, when the Western doctors started to run out of answers, you turn to the Eastern doctors. And when they run out of answers, you sort of start breaking into new ground, perhaps yeah. areas that you might not have ever contemplated. Mm -hmm. And um, one of those things that I looked into or started researching was channeling. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hey, isn't this pretty cool that you could access some other perspective that could maybe give you some other look at what it is that you're going through and why. And so one night I opened to the connection and I was very surprised when I felt something on the other side. Wow. And uh, I've talked with other channelers and we kind of like, so how is it that you feel them? What happens when they come in, you know, I have this little shimmy and I kick my head back kind of, and boom, <laughs> there they are, you know? <laughs> so I'm just, how does that feel for you? How does that feel? Well, in the early days I got chills and I thought I was always coming down with the flu. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> Sometimes okay. I was, mm -hmm. uh, cause I was very sick. Um, and then over time, I don't know, I sensed them more in like all, like a whole body sort of arrival kind of way. Um, the chorus is the predominant group that I have been channeling all these years. They're very loving. They're very expansive. And um, by their definition, they are off our game. They are beyond the energetic structures that we call beliefs. They are technically beyond belief. Right. So they have this very long distance cheering us from the sidelines kind of perspective where everything is amazing and awesome. And so most of the time I knew I had reached them by feeling sort of like a, ah, an ease, yeah. like a, re a release, a relief, sort of just an, like an okayness all of a sudden with everything that was happening. Mm -hmm. And what did they tell you about your illness? Well, something that is, uh, divinely perfect or divinely annoying, however you want to look at it about the chorus, is that yeah. they are uh, exceedingly unspecific. Uh -huh. So they gave me lots of explanations about why we created limitation, why we chose to be here, why we have the experiences that they do. They didn't actually tell me what I was sick with or where to go or who to talk to or what herb to take. Huh. Instead, at each step, they helped me to understand why I was creating these things, why I was feeling these sensations. It was basically walking through a different perspective of my human experience as I went through my human experience. Wow. Now, in the moment, it felt really soothing because I was in or connected to their perspective where all of this is an achievement mm -hmm. and was something we all chose. But coming back down into my 3D perspective afterwards was very challenging and sometimes I'd had enough of them. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I was frustrated. Sometimes I despaired. I was very depressed. Mm -hmm. But 
eventually I would start to integrate whatever it was that they had just taught me. And then I'd go back up the ladder again with another question of, I wonder what they would think about this. Yeah. So it was definitely an oscillation. And over time, I do feel like I started to evolve in my understanding of what I was going through. Mm -hmm. And then as that happened, the symptoms started to change, not because I was attacking the symptoms or trying to get away from them or solve them or whatever, but because I had sort of broadened in my perspective of what illness was. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes illness is an engine for us. It drives us around through beliefs. It, it helps us in our awakening process. And I think I got to a point in my awakening process where I just no longer needed the engine of illness in the same way and the symptoms dissipated. That's fascinating. I'm going through my own healing journey. So I'm very interested in how people, um, you know, got themselves out of the dis-ease, you know, that we create yeah. for ourselves. Wow, that's beautiful. And how many years ago how, uh, did this occur that they came um, to you? And I'd say about nine. About nine years oh. ago was when I started to really get sick. And that's when I started sort of looking into my spirituality in earnest. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it's, I think for most channels, it's like, when did it officially start? I think most of us open and start to sense things and then it turns into more and more specific words. Yeah. So somewhere, somewhere in the last nine years, this started to become more, more tangible, more what it is today. And so how did you approach this new, uh, ability or gift that you had? Did you keep it to yourself for a long time? Did you automatically start videos or how did you react to it? Um, I definitely wasn't sure it was a gift. Mm. I felt that it was interesting and had possibility, but I wasn't convinced yet that it was safe for me or for other people. Okay. So I spent quite a number of years sort of testing it and running my own experiments. So okay. I would, I would write down my question and think of the best possible answers I could think of. And then I would bring through their perspective. And then I would let time pass time, I think has been an important ingredient in this process is I would let it sit, come back to it days later. Mm -hmm. And not only most of the time had forgotten the things that I had written down, but I had definitely forgotten what they said. So it was like a clean comparison. Mm -hmm. Um, I started trying to connect to them at different moments in my life, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. So I would try channeling while I was walking or driving or at the grocery store or around other people or not. Um, but then going through my illness in the beginning, I had to be sort of in a calmer place mm -hmm. to believe that I was really hearing what I thought I heard. Mm -hmm. Um, but as I went through my illness, I mean, there were just times where I was really, really sad or really pissed off. Mm -hmm. And I found that I could reach them too in those yeah. moments and then still hear their perspective. Right. So it really wasn't until about a couple of years ago that I, we wrote our first book together, the book of human awakening, oh, wow. their, their title, <laughs> nice. their ambitious title. Hmm. And then, uh, following the first book, I have it here too. And, um, something that they do is they send over some of their information to me in sketches. Oh. And so the book contains some of the original sketches that they sent to me. Okay. I don't know if you can see it with the background. I don't know it's tough. Um, so anyways, their first book, the book of human awakening is sort of an overview of the awakening process. So aspects of our reality, how we created it, time, you know, distance, body, but also they talk about kind of our emotions. Like what is fear energetically? What is a definition of loss of control energetically? How do they see these things that we experience? Um, and so then after we wrote the first book, I started our podcast, which is called our next existence. Oh, and in each episode, the chorus, I channel a message from the chorus, and then we discuss it in human terms. You know, they'll give like this sort of 80,000 foot view of awakening and this and that and the other. And, you know, and then we discuss, okay, but what do you do when someone cuts you off in traffic? Like, how does that apply to our reality and how do we feel about it as humans? So it's really only in the past couple of years that I've started 
doing these projects. The second book is about to be released. Uh, the second book is their coverage of time. And we just finished the second season of the podcast. Oh, fantastic. Their concept of time. I mean, I've channeled about time and I've, I've been told that we have much more control over it than we believe that we can manipulate it in many, many different ways, especially like when we're in something like in the creative process, then time almost suspends itself. And um, let's see what else was I told about it? That's yeah, beautiful. pretty much, pretty much that, you know. So can you reveal a little bit about what oh, sure. you say? Um, so the chorus views basically our ability to remember as, as practically a revolution on our process to awakening, because by their view, remembering is actually just energetic connection. When I remember another time, I am, I'm actually connecting to that frequency. And they're like, you were here for a long time in a very limited perspective and didn't remember anything. Mm -hmm. So the fact that now, you know, many of us can remember big chunks of our lifetime, but also as you know, I'm sure you're aware and probably some of your listeners are aware we're having memories of other lifetimes or other experiences in this lifetime, right? There are more connections taking place energetically across frequencies. Mm -hmm. And they say that this has a lot to do with not necessarily, but it could be changing our versions of time, but also expanding beyond the aspects of linearity mm -hmm. that we all express. They're like, yeah, you can look at it as linear time. And, you know, you did, you created that as you started to expand, mm -hmm. but what aspects of you are linear that caused you to narrow into this definition? So for example, we have a concept called being interrupted. Mm -hmm. Every human everywhere on the planet can express that sensation, right? Where it's like, oh, I just got this. And now, you know, someone's at the door. Mm -hmm. They said, the reason you have that experience is because you have something called a mental projection. You do these unconsciously all the time mm -hmm. where you're constantly putting out the direction or the string of events that should take place. We do it as soon as we wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. We do it when we get to work and we have an idea of what our day should be like. Right, right. And so they say when something comes in that's not in the mental projection, you sense it first by way of that sensation of interruption before you've even consciously put a name on what the interruption is or what it interrupted. Mm -hmm. So they're saying, as we sort of expand in our ideas of like, anything could happen, I'm here in the present moment. Maybe that was exactly what needed to happen right now, right? You feel sort of this loosening of anything could go. It could be synchronistic. It could be serendipitous. Like who knows what year it is. Does it even matter what day it is? It's just working. Mm -hmm. They're saying that these are the things, these are the beliefs that are expanding us into a more conscious control of time or really a release of the limiting aspects of linear time into a place where our desire and our manifestation becomes the forefront. And really, we're not really concerned anymore about how long it's taking or Right. what day of the week it is any longer. Mm -hmm. We we really, uh, as a society that has been trained to really pay attention to the time, you know, you've only got this much, no, this is the next class, you know, we've got all these stop points in our flow. Um, I had something really beautiful to say, and it just went right out the window. Um, you know, we're trained to do that. Oh, now I know what it is. So yeah, we're, we're trained to, to, to schedule, we're trained to do all these things. And um, it's, it does hinder us. And um, I also uh, heard someone say that they experienced anomalies whether it be like a visitation from uh, some other dimension, an extra dimensional, uh, when they couldn't see the clock. So they would, if they didn't wear a watch, then they would experience all these time anomalies. But if they did, they wouldn't. So I stopped, put, I, I took away the clock from beside my bed and I stopped wearing a watch, um, hoping for the anomalies, but I, I, I still haven't found them yet. <laughs> So yeah. in, the in the beginning, when the course and I started talking about time, they would jokingly call me clock worshiper. Ooh. And I, I didn't understand, you know, I didn't understand completely 
what they meant. I mean, sure, I did like, okay, like I'm always checking the time and how long is that going to take and am I going to get there on time? But this is where they started to point to the overarching aspects of time that we embody, meaning I didn't realize that as I got into an activity, there was a certain amount of time that my beliefs would tolerate unknown mm. before it would be like, I got to figure this out. Like I've had enough rummaging around, like I just got to pick, right? Mm -hmm. So there were these aspects of time that they would point out to me and they would be like, clock worshiper. And I'd be like, what, what did I just do? I didn't even look at a clock. <laughs> It was, you know, but in the moment that I would, I would feel the sensations of time that were driving my action, right? There was a part of me that still wanted to understand this or let it unfold, but there was a belief about this has taken long enough, mm -hmm. right? That sort of creeps in. And the more we give ourselves permission to go a little further, like, well, let's give it 30 more seconds, or maybe let's just put it down and come back to it another day, right? These are the phrases we're starting to use more and more. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can use them in more environments than others. These are the things that then are allowing energy and other stuff to come in rather than just our sheer effort over a period of time, which is the limited, limited place that we're coming from right now. I've been uh, channeling about the go, go, go. Uh, that concept, that program that we have, that we've got to, we've got to produce, we've got to get up and do things. And, you know, God, you know, God forbid you rest, God forbid you take a pause, you know, um, uh, that's been something that has uh, been coming into my life, at least recently. Yes. Do they ever talk? Do they talk about our kind of how we've been programmed to drive, drive, drive and that kind of stuff? Yes, they actually have a very specific definition of doing, yeah. um, and they consider it part of our awakening. Actually, as usual with the course, they think it's incredible yeah. <laughs> that we feel we have to do as much as we do. Uh, so their definition of doing is actually that there's an energetic perception of something that you want. Remember, our desire is our, you know, furthest reaching, energetic, like, woof, life-giving. Desire is life-giving. So we say, oh, I want that. And then the simultaneous recognition that it's not here yet, right? So they come together. And then that activates all the beliefs of our five senses reality that say, well, in order to close that gap, you have to express yourself physically here. It is essentially the culmination of everything we created, which was we're, we're not energetic beings. We're just physical beings, right? I can't just like draw an energy through me and, you know, poof, like create a new car. Mm -hmm. I have to first, I have to research the car and then I have to look for a loan and then I have to, right? It's like faster than fast. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, this is actually everything you came here to experience was your disconnection from your energetic self. Mm -hmm. So in creating all of those beliefs that sort of disavowed the energetic parts of us, we were able to live a fully embodied, fully focused physical experience. Mm -hmm. And now that we're starting to awaken, more of us are feeling sort of like, oh, it could all work out or how did that manifest, right? There's mm -hmm. other options besides just working. Right. Maybe for some of us who are, are a little further in awakening than others, it's a team sport. There's a balance right now. There are some who are still heavily in the five senses, still working their tails off, not even aware of some of these concepts. Mm -hmm. While some of the rest of us are going forward and saying, look at that. Time doesn't matter anymore. Whoa, look at that. These things could manifest instantaneously if we want them to. And they say too, that this is wholesale, a characteristic of awakening too, because as those beliefs activate of like, I got to get stuff done, mm -hmm. there is usually a correlation between the amount of new energy that we're feeling. Mm -hmm. So have you ever felt like something big is coming, something mm -hmm. imminent, either world changing in your world or world at large? Mm -hmm. And then is there something in you that gets like agitated and like anxious and like you find yourself at Costco buying way more things than you need and you're not really sure how you got there? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so they're saying that's happening a little bit right now to our whole planet. There are new energies coming in, big shifts happening. Some of us are more aware in the moment mm -hmm. and are like, whoa, I am really agitated. And as places that I've been, some of us are less aware and just find ourselves deep cleaning all of our closets and we don't even know why we're doing it. 
So as we move forward into this new energy, that will shift, that will evolve. But they say you're a little bit of a hurried group of people right now because you feel an immense energy coming in. Mm -hmm. And you say to yourselves, how can that all fit in our definition of linear time? I better get going. I mm -hmm. better get up and go. Yeah. And as these things start to come together and we sort of rewrite our understandings, what will happen is we'll find out that every moment has infinite time. It can fit in any amount of energy. Mm -hmm. But first we have to sort of release these things that we created about limited or scarce time. Mm -hmm. Is it a release of expectation or a release, uh, you know, how, how would you further kind of like just elaborate on that? So sometimes what's being released is like you said, expectation, there's a mesh here. Our, our reality, our five senses reality is what they call a group consensus, mm -hmm. meaning we all play together, right? We all update a similar database right. and we are all capable of similar things by way of how we define ourselves, mm -hmm. us as earthling humans, perhaps you could say of this day and age. Mm -hmm. So as we begin to loosen our connection to others by way of uh, obligation, guilt, responsibility, we have so many words for the ways that we sort of average ourselves into the group consensus, mm -hmm. then yes, we will be stepping into more of a space that allows for greater possibilities. And in those spaces of greater possibility, we may manifest any number of things that's pertinent to our own paths of awakening. Mm -hmm. But one of the first sensations of that is you will feel sort of a more expansive quality of time. This happened for a lot of people in COVID. Mm -hmm. COVID, as we know, was like a reality bender because some people had awful experiences and some people had total awakening, beautiful experiences, right? There was a gazillion realities happening. But something that happened for many people was that they sort of released or softened their connections to time in a way that might be expressed as they felt a greater ability to be their authentic, their authentic selves. Mm -hmm. So how many people went from having like the perfect business persona mm -hmm. to getting on a zoom call and they're all locked in for COVID and you see their screaming kids in the background, mm -hmm. <laughs> you see the mess all over the floor and how many people had to be like, this is it. I mean, this is my life. Here it is. Right. Mm -hmm. To us as humans, we might not necessarily make an instantaneous connection between that kind of allowance, self-allowance and time, but you can see how, when we allow more of ourselves to be expressed, we're stepping into an open possibility of what else could we be right. When you get on that zoom call, you just realize you can't control any longer how other people see you. Right. Like here it is guys, here's my life. It's a mess. I don't even know how we're getting through every day. <laughs> and in the same step, that is an open possibility of how the other person will respond. But first and foremost, you're expressing yourself. When we do that, we are actually releasing many of those ideas about time that relate to sort of a very confined, very group consensus, very limited expression of selves in a period of time. Mm -hmm. I'm taking notes over here. I think it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Absolutely marvelous. And uh, all right. So you have a, a podcast. You've been doing that for two years. Um, now, you also have other energies that come through you as well. Um, yes. Can you talk to us about those, please? Sure. Um, I channel two other groups at the moment. Uh, both of them are relatively new to me, given that it's been a nine year journey. Uh, the first, uh, it calls themselves the Federation. They showed up about a year ago mm -hmm. and I now understand that that name is like a charged word. There are a lot of definitions of a lot of people who say they channel them at the time. I didn't, I didn't know any of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but they identify themselves as sort of, um, a loose association of beings that are on a similar frequency that desire connections with other civilizations. Yeah. So a lot of the topics that they like to discuss are about humanity, why we do the things we do and how they can better connect to us. It tends to be very high level um, and practically strategic in terms of 
they describe why they came here, why they sort of have tried to reach us in the ways that they have, things like that. Um, and I think in recent months, I've begun to understand that some of what they're expressing is, is the starseed experience, or as we have collectively come to know the starseed experience, they describe, um, the volunteers, why they thought that would be an effective strategy in, in particular among our beliefs, yeah. um, how it would potentially help us create off ramps from the karmic wheel that would help us to remember mm -hmm. and reconnect. Um, because essentially we have a schism of consciousness between our conscious selves and our unconscious selves. And when they incarnate here is one of the few ways that they have been able to reach the conscious parts of us over periods of time. Mm -hmm. So they incarnated across many moments in our linear timeline. So by one view, you could say they've been here for a really long time. By another view, you could say they just arrived, but they've been arriving at simultaneous moments, whatever your definition of time you like best. Mm -hmm. um, and that by incarnating here, star seeds are sometimes able to generate beliefs that hold greater possibilities. And so because they're conscious here, they contribute to that database. Remember, like we were saying, it's a group consensus. Mm -hmm. Well, they come in and now they're a member of the group consensus. So mm -hmm. as they start to have unusual experiences as a child or are able to remember more things as an adult, those things get sent into the database as possibilities that all of us can access. Mm -hmm. Though the strategy of sending in the star seeds was basically a tipping point strategy mm -hmm. where if you sent in enough of them over all the periods of time and they were able in some ways to hold on to an expansive sense of possibility, ultimately there would be so many beliefs of possibility added to the database that the group consensus collective mm -hmm. could sort of move in that direction. And we would all sort of exit the karmic wheel right. if you want to. Right. I guess most of us star seeds or whoever we are, are here to open the expansiveness of our understanding of who we are. Um, do you think that this group, the, the, um, the Federation, right? So is it there the upper consciousness of the beings that incarnated? Is that who they yeah. are? There are beings who have incarnated here that like all the rest of us have um, a larger energetic self that we don't consciously connect to while we're here. But that was sort of our invention of the game board, not necessarily something they created as, by way of coming here. Okay. They wanted to connect the two together. And in fact, by, by their own description, they arrived here because they sensed an energy of connection of it being emanated from humanity. Right. So when they arrived and they found this schism of consciousness, they were having conversations with our energetic parts of us all the time. Hmm. And they were, you know, waiting in some ways for, you know, this final coming together to happen. Okay. And then it didn't happen. And then it didn't happen. And then it didn't happen. So they asked the energetic parts of us, what is this thing that you created? What is this physical reality? And why is there a part of you locked in there that we can't reach? And they said, according to them, the energetic parts of us were just as mystified by how this had been created. So they basically came to a fork in the road, which was, do we keep waiting for this reunification of consciousness to happen like we thought it would? Or do we sort of maybe figure out how to incarnate in there? Do we send people in to see what it's like inside of this reality that we can't really understand from the outside as energetic beings? Yeah. So as I think many know now, um, they sent in a few volunteers. Mm -hmm. Now they had hoped that those volunteers would incarnate, would be birthed into the belief systems and would still somehow be able to access. Mm -hmm the energetic connection to the rest of the Federation that proved to be more difficult than they thought. But then moreover, when those souls died, they got stuck in our wheel of karma. So again, by their description, they said, well, then we had a choice to make. We could either just let our volunteers kind of hang out in your reality and hope that they would reunify when you all reunified or 
we could take action and send in more volunteers. Mm. And by their definition or description, they sent in more and not just a handful more, but many, many, many more came and incarnated here. So they are, they are us. They are among us. You know, honestly, I have, I have many perspectives now on how you could look at this, right? Like from our human perspective here, you could be like, wow, like I could understand if I'm a star seed based on this or based on that. And the Federation might even tell some of us like, yep, you're a star seed. But then I've also had this now nine year running conversation with the chorus who sees all the broad aspects of our game. And they say that if we meet any other beings who share any beliefs of finiteness or insufficiency, meaning they are not infinite in some way, maybe they experience death in some way, or maybe they run out of gas, just like we do. If there's some expression of that, they're in the game with us. So this makes the definition of who's playing really big. Because yeah. you could come across a being who lives for 80,000 years, but then does that being have a death-like experience? Well, then they're not infinite. They're finite like us. We're in the same game. Mm -hmm. So there are times when I feel like the Federation is in the game with us, which means that we're all awakening to something, that maybe we've all forgotten something, that maybe the Federation doesn't completely remember things and maybe we don't, but we're all starting to come back together here under the guise of this earth needing to be saved. But there may be sort of a larger awakening at play. Mm -hmm. And this is where the chorus in the second book has a series of illustrations about their version of our history. Mm -hmm. And they talk about how at one point we were great energetic consciousnesses in the universe and creation and you know sort of our progression through destruction we were powerful forces of destruction all the way up to putting ourselves in what we might classify as an energetic timeout because we were afraid of our own power to destroy we created a sort of little mini universe of limitation that we wouldn't be able to escape from and we created the experience of forgetting and so the chorus is saying, you all are awakening to way back when, to when you chose to forget. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm still figuring out sometimes what I am <laughs> yeah. or what I've forgotten or who the Federation is, or, you know, I've some, some days the label makes sense and it fits. And I'm like, yeah, I resonate with that. That helped me understand that thing. Mm -hmm. And then like a week later, I'm like, nope, I am definitely not that anymore. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. How has this um, altered becoming a channel, receiving all this information? How has it altered your perception of you? A great question. I think, I think more than anything, the past nine years have helped me appreciate our human perspective more than I ever knew I could do. Mm -hmm. I think, I think there were so many ways that I just dismissed what I thought and felt, which they say is the culmination of everything we created here was a total disconnection, not just from our energetic parts of self, but parts of ourselves consciously here, yeah. right? The childlike Katie or the, the whatever happy Katie or the, you know, there were just ways that, I, you know, being in the group consensus, we very subtly dismiss things. We focus at the job at hand, we get a job, we do whatever. And when you hang out with other beings like this, and you ask them a question from your perspective, sometimes the answer is less about the answer and more about it, what it reflects about why I asked the question. We talk about in the start of the second book, an experience I had where I was channeling uh, the mountains, I think it was. So I channel the consciousness of the mountains too. They help a lot with the structure of the books that we've been writing. Um, and they are also connected to our history, meaning they're so vast. Right. They span all the eras of time. So they remember aspects of our history. The Federation remembers aspects of our history because they've incarnated over so many moments in our linear timeline. So the mountains are in the second book too. And I remember when I first met them, 
I asked them, well, how would I know if one of you was malicious? The, the mountains have an aspect of collective consciousness and individual consciousnesses too, just like us. And so I was like, well, what, how would I know if there was like a bad one? Like if I'm hiking or something and they replied, they said, oh, oh, we don't have beliefs of malice like you do. And they described the three things that we believe that create the experience of malice versus the three things that they believe that, that don't. And it's in the book, it's in the second book, and I'll try and remember it. But the first is that we believe we could rendezvous with an experience that is unwanted, mm-hmm. like a car accident. Right. I didn't want to get in a car accident today, right? And they don't. They believe that every single manifestation is perfectly created in that moment. Now, I understand that logically, but do I feel it? No. When I stub my toe, I still get pissed off. <laughs> I'm okay. human. Yeah. But then the second thing they said is you believe in good and evil. Mm-hmm. And they said, we don't, we believe that there are some who are embodying a belief system and experiencing an amazing expression of that belief system. But fundamentally there is no good versus evil. And they said, it's even a known quirk of your dimension huh. of the physical dimension that we have this year. And it's, you know, it's pervasive in our belief systems. And well, I think this is, Go ahead. That, that we believe in evil or that we believe that we believe there is such a thing as good and evil. We believe in that possibility. So we create with that possibility here. Right. Now, every time I heard one of these, I dipped into sort of this moment of like, fuck. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> God, it's so human, right? You have this moment where you reach this expanded perspective and you see yourself in a new way and you're like, well, I would love to believe that there's no good. In you. Right. You have this yeah. moment almost of like, oh, I'm at the bottom of the hill again. Like, how do I integrate this? What does that mean? How do I get better? And I think over time, the way that these conversations most changed how I viewed myself was that I started to see that moment more clearly than the expansive perspective I had just been given. Yeah. And I started to say, what is that? Why do I react like that after I've just been given a beautiful answer? Why does that keep happening? Yeah. And I think through that process, I started to realize more of what I am. I started to maybe stop arguing with it so much, stop hating it so much, just sort of allow for the fact that I don't have that perspective. I'm not the mountains. I don't have that perspective. I'm not the chorus. I'm not the Federation, but I'm me. Mm -hmm. I'm human. And none of them are. None of them are like any of us. None of them are masters of limitation. None of them have been tough enough, honestly, to make it through this reality. Mm -hmm. And so I started to feel more and more my humanness Mm -hmm. in the midst of these conversations in a way that was loving, allowing, empowering, To the point to where I started, I felt like to really see things eye to eye with other beings, as opposed to approaching them in sort of this supplication kind of way of like, why am I sick? You know, that's where I started my journey. And now I sort of, there's less that I feel like I need to fix here. There's more I'm interested in understanding. It just feels lighter. Mm. It doesn't feel like the bottom of the hill as much as maybe is it the middle of the hill now. (laughs) I'm not going to claim I'm at the top of the hill. I know better because I'm human, but it's got lighter. It it got easier to be me in a universe that's full of a lot of different perspectives. Very nice. Very, very nice. So the, the second night that you channeled for us at that convention, you brought through a group called the ancient ones. Um, Yeah. They spoke a lot about, civilizations that were on earth that they were a part of um i'd love to hear more about how these beings got to you and um what their intention here with us is so the the ao we call them the ancient ones um for sure because i'm not really sure we haven't we haven't labeled them yet either. It's all big open mystery in a lot of these situations, which I think is a good thing at this juncture in awakening. I think it's a little too early <laughs> for specifics. 
So I started to hear them when I was on a trip in the U.S. Southwest, oh. and we went to Chaco Canyon, mm -hmm. and I started hearing these voices come through. Now, in the beginning, all I could hear sometimes was one word repeated over and over. It felt very different than the chorus. The chorus is sort of like this whole body enveloping, loving embrace. You know, the AO feels very human to me. Their communication style is, I wouldn't say as linear as ours is, where I have to say one word at a time to you, but they do have an aspect of... Um, finiteness or specificity that conveys itself as language, whereas the chorus doesn't. Mm -hmm. So over the next few months, these past recent few months, I've gone to more and more ancient sites and I've been able to hear them more and more. Now I hear them any old time. Yeah. Um, their explanation is that they are from a parallel timeline. If you like simultaneous timelines or historical place if you like linear timelines however you like to define it mm -hmm. but they describe that they were sort of part of the decision or were there for when um a an evil force you could say arrived some sort of invading force some sort of conquering force and they separated themselves into basically another reality or another frequency, however you want to say it. And there are remnants of that civilization here that we can still see with our, you know, with our eyes on visible wavelengths of light. Wow. Um, have you ever seen them? You're no. saying we can actually physically see them? We can see the remnants of their constructions. Oh, yes. Okay. They do say that we are coming to a place as we expand, our embodiments change, right? If I embody more expansive beliefs, then there's a good chance I'll be able to see more things or feel more things. Most of us are already experiencing this. We're feeling more things. The eyes are going to be, in some cases, one of the last things to change because the eyes were constructed as part of our way of limiting ourselves from being with the universe. We rely so heavily on these very narrow frequencies of the visible spectrum of light that we often distract ourselves from the things we're feeling, right? Like ever walked up to someone extremely attractive? <laughs> You're so distracted. You don't even hear your heart screaming like, run away, <laughs> you know, right? So our eyes were a part of how we locked ourselves into this timeout for being destructive. So first, we're opening up other parts of our energetic self, connecting to other places. They talk a lot about the heart, how our hearts had been closed, and now they're reopening. And as they do so, we're going to understand things more rapidly. We're going to connect to more beings more easily. The heart is also a way of traversing frequencies in, in, in other very tangible ways, like time travel or distance travel, however you want to say it. Some of those songs, some of those frequencies can be expressed by way of the heart, which means we may not necessarily, as humanity, we may not necessarily need devices in right. the same ways that others do to traverse those frequencies. We have our incredible hearts, which we are now starting to awaken to and remember how powerful those are. Right, right. Wow, that's just lovely. Tell me some of the ways that uh, the uh ancient ones have kind of like taught you things uh I, i've heard stories about how you've been at different sites and they sent you to places and you were doing grid work can you talk to us a little bit about that sure um grid work is a term i learned about three months ago oh, okay <laughs> when i when we were doing it mm -hmm. so i i do not claim to be an expert on any of these topics i am learning as i go but the things that they have taught me are sort of more about um, our shared history. So when the conquering force arrived, choices that they made. Mm -hmm. And then also how they view our reality and our closed hearts and sort of what they think could help us. So there are physical explanations, like um, some of the pyramids that we see were intentionally disassembled, mm -hmm. they say. Um, that there is still energy that connects there, but that the structures themselves were disassembled in a way that the invaders would not be able to utilize them. 
in the same way. Um, so that's why they say many of us who are energetically connected, when you go to some sites, you can still feel something. They say, yeah, the energy's still there. The structure was just sitting there to harness the energy. But the structures, some of them were intentionally disassembled so that it would not harness the energy in the same way for the others to utilize. Okay. They say that they, or we, or however you want to define it, um, we are capable of understanding energy and connecting with it. And that's not necessarily true of every other race or civilization or species out there. Some just wanted to come and basically commandeer our ability to make these connections. They don't, they don't have the ability to feel the energy and connect to it in the same way that we do. Mm -hmm. So they like to emphasize that even though some of these sites have been since destroyed and there was a battle and a lot of things have happened, they're like, the energy's never lost, right? We'll be able to sense it again, find it again. I think that's happening for many of us all over the world right now. But then on the energetic side, things that they have taught me are about basically the human heart. Now, whether you want to say the physical muscle or, you know, the energetic chakra kind of place, mm -hmm. they've taught me a lot about how subtly and how constantly things in our environment close the heart again close the heart again, close the heart again. So as we start to open it a little bit and feel a little more and love a little more, you know, there are things here that you could say have been designed to, you could also say we signed up for the limitation of right, right, right. <laughs> shutting down our heart. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like, it's like running through your days with a track coach, because as I, you know, go out into my day, I will now be driving in my car or something and I see something awful on the side of the road, like maybe two people yelling at each other at a bus stop on the way to drop off my kid at school. Normally, I would not have been conscious of that moment. My eyes would have veered over to the side and would have seen that and I would have felt a little, like a little baby heart closing. And now the AO comes through and they're like, ah, that just happened. Did you feel it? And it's amazing. It's amazing how subtly our hearts just shut down, shut down, shut down. Now left alone, they probably would just continue to blossom, but we're awakening from this experience of limitation. And whether you want to take the AO's definition, which is there is an invading force that's here and has created this, or you want the chorus's definition, which was, well, you signed up to be limited and you sure created an amazing experience of limitation. <laughs> you just got conquered, right? Whichever view you take it, there is, I would say across the board, an energetic understanding that without constantly creating limitation, mm -hmm. we would naturally bubble up to the surface. We would naturally expand. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so I've often had the analogy that we're a beach ball and we're being artificially kept under the water, that it's our nature to float to the surface. That's why they have to poison us. That's why they have to, to manipulate our, our, our thoughts and our minds and teach yes. us these horrible routines, you know, uh, yeah. these awful programs. Yes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as awakening continues, the heart knows the difference. Right. So what did I do in that example? When Remember, we talked about the eyes being one of our greatest blinders and disconnectors from the energy of the universe. And where did my eyes go? Do, 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 do. <laughs> Looking at the disaster at the bus stop. <laughs> now, if I had been in a heart centered place, if I had been from that place emanating outwards, there is a good chance that my eyes would have behaved differently. But instead, I was churning do I have enough time to get that done today? Can I go to Costco and get the gas after I drop him off? Right. Do you feel the difference? Yes. And then my eyes went, oh, we'll show you more limitation to think about. Very good. Mm -hmm. So they say, as we continue to go forward in awakening, yes, there are going to be more things that potentially could blind us, but as an equal and rising force, we're going to become more aware of what our heart has to say about everything that we're seeing. Yeah. Beautiful. Do they often, do they say that this evil force is still here? Do they talk about that? Did they talk about us, you know, rising above it? Do they offer us hope, potential hope that this is going to end or? Yeah. By their, by their view and the views of many others, we are still in, in the war zone. Yeah. 
and we're waking up to being in the war zone from within the war zone. I think there's much, much more to our human story that is going to come out over the next few years. Aspects of ancient history, ways we ended up here. There have been cataclysms, as we all know, but there are nuances of those cataclysms that not only show us more about the limitation we chose here, but also show us more about potentially the ways we're going to resolve this and expand beyond it as a group. So they are very hopeful. Well, first of all, the chorus doesn't even have an expression of hope because to them, there was nothing that ever was in danger of not being overcome. We were always going to awaken by their view because love to them is, is the doorway to the rest of the universe. Allowance is what creation is. Creation is expansion. Mm -hmm. So there's no, there's no stuck. The Mm -hmm. idea of being stuck is a human idea that we have been living up to its fullest. (laughs) So the course is like, you are never not going to awaken. All of this is assured. Have a good time. The AO, who is, I would say, in the game, right? Maybe in a parallel timeline, but in the game, tells me that the reason that I and others can start to perceive them right now is because that reconnection is happening. Meaning we've expanded back to a place of being able to hear them, encounter them, eventually, I think, see them as we expand into those wavelengths where they are visible. Mm -hmm. So it's already happening by some views. Very good. Very good. Good, good things and hopeful. Very good and hopeful. Because a lot of times we just, we get tired. You know, we're tired of it. You were mentioning something about this earlier. Those of us who are in the know, you know, I've been in this community for many years and it's getting tiring because we we, um, don't see progress. But I think that under the surface, in hearts and minds, there's a lot of progress. A lot of eyes are being opened. You know, people are understanding that things are not what we've been told. And it's very obvious in the media, very obvious in the government. So I yeah, think just, agreed. Yeah. So at the same time, I've also been told that, you know, our job is truly to just live a happy life and to live in a joyful frequency as much as possible and that enough uh will will raise the collective consciousness will raise the frequency so yeah do they talk you about know, that yeah with i've had i've had multiple uh perspectives on that from from all the beings mm-hmm. but you know this is this is what i'll say is like a human some days some days it just sucks And I get to say that because Mm -hmm. I'm here. Mm -hmm. Some days are just hard and I have come a long way in letting them be hard and letting myself go buy a pint of ice cream or, you know, sit on the couch or let my kid have extra screen time because like, we're both feeling the energies, you know, instead of like judging myself about being a mom. So, but also I think something that has gotten me through is being able to enjoy the 3d Mm -hmm. in some days, honestly, when it's really hard telling myself that I should enjoy the 3d is like just backfires. Like there are some days that, that you can't, you just can't, you're feeling the expansive energies, you know, the possibility of those places and the contrast between that and this is intense. Mm -hmm. And the more I have let myself have bad days, the faster they go. It used to be bad weeks, I'll be honest. Wow. And then it turned into bad days. And then now it's a bad morning. And sometimes now it's a bad hour or a bad 15 minutes. And I think like you, many of us who've been on the path, you get more and more aware of these things that you're feeling as they come up. Yeah. And I used to have all these reasons, all these doing reasons that now was not a good time. I'll cry later. I'll cry on the drive home. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I can't deal with this right now. Right. All those things that come up and now I'm like, well, crying's happening. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Whoever's me. around it's yeah. happening. 
for me, it's I get mad at myself because I'm letting things upset me and I get frustrated with myself. But then I have to look and say, well, gosh, you know, we're, we're going through it. We're in the weeds. Yeah. We are, we are in the battlefield, you know, so yes. we have to honor the emotion. We have to honor the feelings that we feel and, um, you know, allow that it's not a failure to be yeah. human. That's why we're here. We're here to experience yeah. it all, right? We're here to, yeah. to have that, that, you know, the, the highs and the lows, you know, right. But like you said, once you understand the greater picture, the lows start getting less and less and less yeah. and less. Yeah. Um, or at least means, faster. Yeah. Or faster. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know that I can comment on the frequency yet, but I know that like the speed has definitely accelerated where I will feel a wave of depression that might've taken me down for weeks, years ago. Okay. And I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. here it is. This is depressing. <laughs> Yeah. And then 10 minutes later, I realized that I got a text message from a friend or something, and I was able to just move on into that emotion next. Right. It The right. more we allow ourselves to be what we are, the more we're actually releasing all those limiting beliefs. And the chorus says the greatest surprise from awakening will be how much potential, how much purpose are in all aspects of your emotional spectrum. And that really your experience of limitation was disallowing huge parts of you, of your emotions. The fact that we're like, oh, I should feel better. I should be happy or right. right? That's what we're awakening to. Yeah. And they say, you're doing it by going through it. So every time you feel that wave of depression or sadness and you say, okay, I'm chopping broccoli. I guess we're crying now. <laughs> Seems perfect. Right. <laughs> and the more we just let that happen the more we release those beliefs that told us we shouldn't cry, we can't, it's that heaviness that is leaving us until finally it becomes like a joyful expression of self mm -hmm. all the time. And, it, and the hardness, the friction of rejecting those emotions, trying to control them and put them in a the right order, that's what goes away. Right. And they said, we will find in that place all sorts of things that we're capable of, all sorts of beings who are excited to meet us because by way of accepting more of those parts of ourselves, that's how we expand into a more allowing and accepting place of seeing, being, experiencing the rest of the universe. That's it. Beautiful. Well, it, it's, we've been going for a little time now. Um, I am so glad to have you on this platform. I hope, uh, you receive lots of new friends, lots of new people uh, to tune into your work. Um, now, you said you have two books and uh, you showed us one. What's the second one called? The second one is the Book of Human Remembrance. It's their book on time and memory. Um, and that one will be released in the next coming weeks. Um, oh, wonderful. So, so yeah, if you sign up for our newsletter on our website, uh, you'll get announcements of when the book is ready. And our website is katieandthechorus.com. Beautiful. And where do we find your podcasts? Um, it's available on most podcasting platforms. So Apple, Google, Spotify, and it's called Our Next Existence by Katie and the Chorus. Okay. Thank you so very, very much uh, for, Thank for spending you. some time with me. You're lovely. I can't wait to do things with you in the future. Oh, my goodness. I'm forgetting probably one of the most exciting things. I was wondering if you would bring one of your groups through to give us a little message or something. Sure. Right now, or are we over time? Would, no, would you... we're okay. We can do it. Okay. Who would you prefer to hear from, the chorus or the AO? Oh, I don't know. Probably let's do the chorus since that's. Yeah, I felt that too. Big, big picture kind of people. <laughs> big love kind of, kind of beings. Uh, yeah. Thank you. All How right. Exciting. Dearest ones. We celebrate so much the expressions of your perspectives that you have shared here today. Expressions here in words 
and also the energetic expressions that have come to us from all viewers, from all times, from all experiencers of this energy. It is a delight for us to be with you on your path through awakening. We learn much each and every day watching how you weave the colors of your realities into broader expressions of love and light. It is no small thing to have created a reality of such limitation where you have been unaware of so much, unremembering of so much. And yet, though it was a practically watertight creation, here you are, expanding once again, finding the love of creation yet again, and showing us all new understandings of what creation is and how powerful love can be. We are with you each and you all every step of the way. Our energy is here for you in any way that it may be helpful to you on this journey. And as always and through all things, in your reality, we love you infinitely. Oh, that was lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you, the chorus. Thank you. That thank is you, just Marie. beautiful. So, thank you, dear Katie, and thank you, everyone, for uh, hanging out until the end of this podcast. Um, once again, I'm Anne Marie, the Art of Healing. You can find me at annemarietheartofhealing.com. And we will see you soon. Thank you. Yeehaw. <laughs>